so much, Rick. You have to do all my introductions from now on. Um, you have had uh, a nine-hour day, and you've had multiple uh, summits such as these over the last few years devoted to planning and building and strategizing the future of global infrastructure. What you deserve now is to see what the world is going to look like when your mission is complete. And I'll give you the punchline up front, the thesis. It's that what you're, the mission that you're on is really a, uh, the kind of project that happens once every three or four or 500 years. It is the complete reorganization of the human species. Jonathan opened a session this morning by talking about how cities are the ultimate disruption. And in, in, in that sense, they really are. Because what is happening with this global infrastructure build out is a reorganization of mankind from nations and states and borders towards cities and infrastructures and supply chains and connections. And our maps should reflect that. Today, our maps are very biased, of course, towards states and boundaries. Instead, the maps of the future should be showing cities and infrastructural connections. So that's what I'm going to show you now in the next uh, 10 minutes. Starting with what the world looks like when, when you focus not on the borders that, that divide states, but rather on the mega city clusters, the urban archipelagos. The maps on your walls today in your offices have every city as an equally sized little black dot. But I think you know all too well that that's not what the world already looks like, let alone 10, 15, 20 years from now. Now, each of these ovals or archipelagos of cities is a story unto itself. We're in one of them right now, right? The enormous growth of the Silicon Valley region, the connectivity that will occur when we get that high-speed rail built down to Los Angeles. Um, you can see what's, uh, you know, the Boston to Washington corridor, greater Sao Paulo. I put uh, Lagos Benin City there. I envision 20, 25 years from now, there'll be a light rail network that will stretch uh, from uh, Lagos, Nigeria, westward across uh, uh, Benin, Togo, Ghana, to the Ivory Coast. Uh, and that, that's the kind of scale. Uh, some of these are, are my favorites, like Abu Dhabi and Dubai are really becoming Abu Dubai as they merge together. Um, and you know, the, the scale of these cities is absolutely enormous the further you move from west to east. The most populous cities in the Western world, such as London, Los Angeles, or Moscow, have about 10 to 12 million people. But as you well know, the scale of the Asian megacity is more along the lines of 60 or 70 or 80 million people. So let's look a little bit further at that. Again, why have maps that, that bias the sort of political world? What we should be focusing on is the functional world. Where are we? How are we connected? What are we doing? Where is the economic value? That's what I've tried to do here. This is the distribution of the world population across the world. And uh, you can see those light oval outlines of the major urban geographies. And the circles represent the, the share of GDP represented by the one, or, or in some cases, two major cities uh, uh, of, that, of that country. And you can see that there is an overwhelming uh, economic power uh, clustered in some of these uh, financial centers or, or capital cities around the world. And this is both a good thing and a bad thing, right? When, when I see, on the one hand, these are the mega cities that we celebrate and we think are thriving economic hubs of the future. On the other hand, they might also be terribly overcrowded and congested. And those are the same countries where you want to see a lot more investment going into second tier cities. So you can dissipate the population, so you can create more jobs, so you can distribute growth, so that you can create more productivity outside of the main capital. So there's good news and bad news embedded in this new economic geography. This map is a, a hat tip, actually, to, uh, to McKinsey. Uh, it's, it's derived and adapted from a recent report that, uh, that McKinsey has done on China. You can see that this, again, the functional reorganization of, of Chinese uh, sort of you know, a, a po political uh, space. Now, this is not just in China. Uh, China is indeed going through this process of reorganizing into these super municipal boundaries. But China, like many other countries, has you know, deep and rich histories at the provincial level. And yet, even in countries like Italy, what has uh, Prime Minister uh, Renzi done when, when coming into office? He said, we need to reorganize Italy around 14 uh, viable economic clusters, these super urban areas. The same thing is happening in the United Kingdom. The same thing is happening in France. Country after country, again, where you think of, of deep linguistic and ethnic 
provincial uh, identities. Instead, countries are getting much more practical and thinking functionally and saying, how do we reorganize ourselves around viable economic clusters? And China, to its credit, is, is very far ahead and, and, and evolving in this, in this process all the time in the ways in which it is either forcing or encouraging cities that are near each other to start to collaborate to cluster, to build infrastructure across uh, their, their, their distances. A great example of this, of course, is the Pearl River Delta region, uh, you know, anywhere from eight to 11 different, uh, different cities. And if you think about Hong Kong and Macau, even different political status have managed to, over the last uh, 30 years, but increased particularly the last 10, build so much connectivity within those cities that it's becoming one super mega city area. Some say that you know, this will, some predict the aggregate population of this area will rise to uh, 70 or 80 million people, a GDP of $2 trillion by 2030. What is this? Let's take a step back and talk about how this relates to global economic governance. When you think about organizations like the G20, uh, whose membership is, uh, of course, a political co construct of uh, countries of East, West, North, and South, uh, wealthy and developing countries, you know, there are members of the G20 that are not systemically relevant uh, national economies, right? Uh, uh, the, the Pearl River Delta is already larger than Argentina and is a share of GDP. It's probably more systemically relevant as well. Should we be rethinking how we build our global governance institutions on the basis of this world in which, uh, in which uh, urban centers matter more in many cases than national economies? I think we should. One of the things that was on that previous map was, of course, the city of Shenzhen, the place where uh, China's uh, economic miracle began by uh, opening to foreign investment, by becoming a supply chain hub. One of the most uh, striking and, uh, and, and sort of uh, systemic trends in the world of urbanization is also political, and that is the re-regulation of space, the creation of special economic zones. Starting in the 1950s, there were only a handful, four or five special economic zones in the world, Mauritius, Dominican Republic, Shannon, Ireland, Shenzhen announced in 1979. Today, there are 4,000 such zones in the world. And this is how cities get themselves on the map, by opening to foreign investment, by branding themselves as special economic zones, by attracting supply chains, by participating in the competition in the global division of labor. Asia has led the way in terms of the number of special economic zones, the number of people employed in special economic zones, the, 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 the volume of exports coming out of special economic zones, and now other regions are learning the lesson. The United Arab Emirates has about 150 such zones within a very small country, uh, most of which are just in the city of Dubai. When you walk through Dubai, you're crossing through different jurisdictional and regulatory areas every time you cross the street and you don't even know it. But that's part of what makes the country what it is and what's helped it um, uh, become, put itself on the global map. Because Chinese wages are rising, China is now exporting this idea of, of uh, or this uh, sort of deployment of special economic zones to places like Africa. So you can see Chinese jobs being offshore to industrial, Chinese-run industrial parks in Ethiopia, South Africa, and elsewhere. So when you think about cities, think also about the startup cities, which often begin as these special economic zones, and then eventually grow into more organic kinds of uh, environments. So, Special economic zones are a way of attracting supply chains, getting on the map, rising in power. Infrastructure is also how uh, China can project uh, power. And we talked a little bit today about the uh, AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, for which there's also complementary funds like the, the, the Silk Road Fund and um, and so forth. It's more than, in, in aggregate, at least uh, maybe $150, $200 billion of capital committed to Eurasian infrastructure projects. And this is a map that shows you how this vast space, this land mass, the largest continent in the world, Europe and Asia, really is going to, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, become more and more integrated. In fact, the process really began when the Soviet Union collapsed, because it was really then that China realized that it borders more former Soviet republics than Russia itself does, and it began to build pipelines and railways and roads across those countries. Uh, so this Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that's sort of popped up in the headlines for many of you this year is really the fourth uh, or fifth wave of Chinese cross-border investment. And China has more neighbors than any country in the world, so it makes perfect sense for it to be doing this. Um, in, in, these, in these Central Asian republics. I, I personally have been traveling in these countries uh, for many years, uh, since, since the 1990s, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, 
Pakistan, you, you name it. If it ends in Stan, I've been spending a lot of time there. My friends call me Paragistan sometimes. Uh, and I can tell you that, that this is not just the news story of this year. 10 years from now, we will still be talking about the AIIB. 15 years from now, we will still be talking about the AIIB because China is committed to this infrastructural integration of Eurasia. And Europe, of course, is equally committed to capitalizing on the business opportunities that it represents. So I fully expect this to continue. And what I've done in this map is to sort of, uh, of course, you know, in the legend, you can see what the projects are, uh, rail railways, highways, gas, pipelines, oil pipelines, and so on and so forth. Now, how, how, is, how is the West going to compete with that? It, too, has to integrate into a supercontinent. And I'm glad to see that, that now we hear more and more about uh, graduating from NAFTA towards a North American Union. Again, our conventional maps focus so much on the, the parallel. Is it the 49th or the 50th parallel? I can never remember. Between the US and Canada, right? And then the border between the US and, and Mexico. The truth is that if you map the infrastructures, there are electricity grids, railways, freight railways. Uh, the XL pipeline doesn't sound like it's going to happen soon, but there's many other ways in which energy uh, uh, crosses these borders. We we now have a lot more supply chain integration between the United States and Mexico, for example, especially in the automobile industry. So if we, if we map the infrastructures, we get a much better sense of just how connected uh, uh, North America is also becoming. And the economic reality across the borders actually reflects that, and I believe we should put it on our maps. In case you're wondering about the, the blue lines, I think that's particularly significant for, uh, for California and the southwestern states. That's a map of proposals for hydrological canals that would bring Bring transport water either from um, the Great Lakes region or Hudson Bay or the glaciers um, uh, of Canada all the way down in various ways to the southwest of the United States. And some of you uh, who know your, I guess, you know, history of topographical engineering in North America, some of these ideas have been around since the 1960s, and they certainly seem pretty relevant and necessary at this point in time when we think about the water crisis here. Now, so much of the conversation is also about the United States, and I think uh, you know, many people who are urban economists and, uh, and, and also political scientists have pointed out how increasingly the map of the, the either the 40, lower 48 states seems increasingly sort of antiquated in this day and age. And instead, we should be thinking about the economic regions, the economic geography, again, the functional geography of the United States. So, we have, uh, you know, the color-coded are the sort of, uh, uh, you know, regional uh, uh, zones of the U.S. The major cities are the sort of the black dots and the hubs. The white lines are the high-speed uh, rail net, or the, the, the straight white lines are the high-speed rail networks that should connect them. I've tried to integrate into this, or I wanted to, a map of the long-range uh, internet trunk cables, but that's actually sensitive, so I'm not allowed to, to put it on this, uh, on this map, unfortunately. But you get a sense of what the real structure of the U.S. economy is in terms of its you know, true and new economic geography. And we should think in these terms in order to aggregate these regions much more effectively. Think back to the map of China's clusters of, uh, of city regions. That, too, is how the U.S. should be thinking. <coughs> Finally, you know, uh, this is actually just a very, very small fraction of the, the maps that I've been putting together, uh, all of which are going into the connectography book uh, that's coming out next year. But I wanted to also build something online that I call the Connectivity Atlas. And this is probably already, uh, even though it's just in its early, in, it's in, in its infancy of collecting data, probably the largest free online source of all the world's uh, transportation, energy, and communications infrastructures that are legally allowed to be put online. Every airport, seaport, um, internet cable that's not lit up right now, um, you know, oil pipeline, railway is actually here. You can choose by theme, by sector, by geography. You can navigate and move around. And we're constantly collecting data to upload to this. So it's a way for, if you're in the EPC world, it's a way to see, um, in fact, I'm going to build in a section about proposals and sort of scenarios, projects that haven't happened yet that, that, that could or should that are, that are, that are sort of uh, on the radar. So you can start to see where things are going to happen and plan around that. Uh, if you're in the investment world, you could be looking at what are the proposals and projects out there that, that one could consider investing in. The bottom line of all of this is that uh, you know, connectivity is, to me, not just, uh, not just a physical thing. It's also, of course, it is the asset class of the 21st century. 
it is that which should we should be focused on, moving away from this political world of nations and borders and how we legally divide it towards the functional world of how we build and connect our populations, particularly our cities. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and I uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you.